Okay, good morning. Thank you. I know a lot of us have uh, heard a, a few things here. So what I wanted to do in kind of the game action plan, if, you're, if you will, is to run through a quick briefing here for you on what these interpretations are. But uh, and what you'll get as a handout a little bit later this afternoon is a copy of all four of the interpretations as they were received here. And then also a copy of this presentation and just a notes view so you can put some notes along the right side or give your scheduling folks or whatever as appropriate. And then we'll work on the appropriate communications out of the back end of the whole uh, presentation here. So let me get started here. So there are four interpretations that came out literally while we were in uh, committee yesterday. Uh, they're all independent requests. Um, they were literally the same questions that we had on a request uh, to the FAA. Um, earlier, um, it, everything from individual pilots to the Teamsters to uh, uh, a few other folks. The interpretations mainly deal with reserve extensions and pilot and command concurrence. So, you know, really, I think what you'll find is a lot of the things that we were talking about. For the most part, I think you'll find everything is helpful, but in the typical way these things work out, we didn't get all the answers we really wanted or necessarily even all the clarity we wanted on, uh, on, the, on the specifics of each one of these. But before we start, I would like to just draw your attention to the actual language here for fitness for duty because there's a lot of discussion in each of these uh, interpretations, several of these interpretations, about fitness for duty. So, um, and one of the interpretations draws the attention to make sure that, you know, it's incumbent on all of uh, the pilots and all the operators that they know and comply with this particular part of the regulation. So I'll let you take a look at this and read it instead of reading it to you. There's uh, two pages to it here, uh, sections uh, A through B. But this is really a core piece and I, what I really want to draw your attention to is a couple important points with this and that is that everybody involved in this whole operation, if you will, the pilots and the operators, the certificate holder, as the FAA calls it, everybody has a role and a responsibility, and we're going to be held to the same standard as well. And it does play when we start talking about extensions, when you can extend an extension, because this is the reference point that you come back to. And this is the second page. Once again, I have a copy of this in the, uh, in the slide deck for you as well. So the real... The real piece of this whole deal is if, you, if a pilot does not believe they can continue, they have a responsibility and a requirement to report it. And at the same time, the certificate cannot per, holder cannot permit you to go fly if you've made that determination. <clears throat> and then there's the last part, and we'll be talking about that with the dispatcher flight release, that you're affirmatively stating he or she is fit for duty prior to commencing the flight. And that'll be an important part with one of these interpretations about the timing on when that occurs. So let's start off with the first one. And I'll just, uh, as is generally the case, whoever uh, writes and requests, you, uh, you pick up the honor of having the interpretation na named after you if they, if they respond to it. So the background to this as we head in is that the F, uh, Part 170 defines the rest period as a continuous period. Um, and the question that came about, as you can read there, <clears throat> the question that came about on the interpretation, and uh, this came from a, a United pilot that uh, made an individual interpretation or a request for interpretation. There's a contractual obligation to check a reserve schedule on a day off or while in rest during a set window of time constitute duty for the carrier, and the answer is, is yes. So the, the question was, is I'm halfway through a 30-hour break in duty, and is there, does the contract trump the FAR? Can they make me check my schedule? You could have a requirement to check the schedule, but you're no longer at rest. And you're, you're now performing duty for the certificate holder. And, that, and this really kind of draws through. If, there's, if he or she is contractually required to check the reserve schedule, you're on 30 hours, supposed to end at 2300, and from 6 until uh, midnight you are on reserve or you have an obligation to check, you are performing duty for the company, and you're no longer at rest. Okay, now we're going to start getting into <clears throat> extensions. So that, as you uh, can see, Part 117-19 allows the FT to be extended up to two hours with the concurrence of the PIC. The first question is, um, can the pilot command concur in a two-hour extension that arises due to unforeseen operational circumstances before signing, before takeoff by signing 
the, the release. In other words, I'm sitting in the aircraft and um, I'm signing the release. Am I signing for a full extension at the time? One of the things that's missing, and I think this interpretation helps out, is you can't sign for the extension until you know about the extension. In other words, you, you can't sign on that sheet of paper saying, I know I have two hours extension and, hey, if we need to use it now or later on, we'll go ahead and use it. You have to affirmatively state you're going to use it when you have the knowledge of the need to use it. And that's a big difference from the way some of the previous language and, and a way I probably could go around to just about every carrier at the table here is implementing it. <clears throat> so as you see here, anywhere you see in the, in the uh, slide presentation, the copy that you get where you'll see the word held or the FAA held, that is that we're using their language out of the interpretation in this slide presentation, this document for you to use. So they've held that a document signed before the PAC found out about the need for an extension would not be sufficient to concur with the extension. Some other affirmative action has to happen when it's known that the extension must now be used. So I don't get to sign in at the beginning of the day for the length of my duty period plus the extension. I sign in for what my duty day is. Maximum FDP off of table B or C is what I'm signing in, I'm fit for duty. When I know that I'm now going to have to use an extension, I have another affirmative action that must be taken. I have to tell them it's okay to use it at that time. The second question that came about, is this include the first 30 minutes? And the answer is yes. All the same methodology for the, the last 90 minutes, if you will, applies here for when you can use it. It's not a, there's no requirement to report things out of that 30 minutes. But to be able to use it, it has to be known, there has to be a triggering event that causes the use, and there has to be the knowledge that you're now going to have to use it, and then you have to affirmatively say, I can use it. Key points. We've been kind of blowing through that a little bit. And as you can see, it's, it's really the same thing. And where this really gets, so here's a practical application, okay? You're out. You're scheduled for a 12-hour flight duty period. You push out on the last segment, and when you push back and you're taking a quick look at how your duty day is working out, you go, I'm going to have enough time for my paperwork to push back, taxi out on schedule, take off and fly it as scheduled, taxi in as scheduled, and I'm going to have 15 minutes to spare. You get to the end of the runway. You're in the, in the conga line waiting to take off. The thunderstorm hits. You take a 30-minute delay. Now you know that there's an event that's caused it. Now you know there's a need to use it. There needs to be a positive affirmation that you approve that use as the pilot in command at that time, not when you pushed. Second interpretation has to do with short call reserves and the ensuing flight duty period. So really to save you uh, the need to get into the Advil bottle here on all the language and such, what we're really saying, the, the core piece is two, two pieces here. The methodology that we have been saying to calculate what your maximum combination of a reserve availability period and an FDP that we've been telling the members has been affirmed by the FAA. That's the first piece. What has not been affirmed by the FAA, because all the examples that they used in this all yielded a number, it's around 12 or 11 or 12 hours is the max. And if you add the extension, you're still under 16. The question that we've had for a long time is, the amount of time I've been on reserve and the max flight duty period, if I add a two hour extension that goes over 16, is it allowable? I don't think that it is. I think there's preamble language and other language in the FAR that says 16 is a hard max that we can point to. But the reality of it is the FAA did not ask the question. So, it will be very soon they'll get another letter from us asking a very specific question to give them the math that draws them out that far so they can tell us exactly what their feelings on that is. So I wish I had a more positive answer out of this interpretation for you on that, but I don't. The positive on this particular piece is that the, the, math, the methodology and the math that we've told our pilots on how to calculate this is, is correct. The next one is um, another one along the lines and, and really the core issue on this has been there's three pieces to this. When we define an FDP, the original language of the rule 
is the FDP ended when you set the parking brake on your last segment, when you have no further intent for aircraft movement. Fast forward to the very first interpretation we got on this. It said this interpretation, or, and I'll hit over here for you, is that there's not um, an affirmative intent for further aircraft movement. In other words, that's the company's intent. I don't, I'm not going to have you move an airplane again. So what we're doing is we're moving from you setting the brake to stop to we don't have anything more, we're not going to move that airplane to this one, which basically says this, and just boil it down to the language. If, if your duty period is to fly one segment and then deadhead another segment, and then you're done, okay, the FDP under the original language would end after the flying segment and would not include the deadhead segment. So once you set the brake, you're done. Any kind of reassignment, you could make a case where you couldn't do it. The next interpretation kind of started to open the door a little bit. This one basically says this. You are, until they affirmatively, here we go with the affirmatively tell again, until they affirmatively tell you your FDP's ended or you've hit the maximum number at a table B or C, you can be rescheduled. So I think there's two pieces that go with this. I had just a, a two hour flight that I'm supposed to run over and deadhead somewhere to position. You show up. If under the original rule, it's the same aircraft type that you can, you're qualified on. It was really gray about whether they could go, I need you to go fly this airplane because this crew got stuck and keep the operation moving. Well within your FDP, et cetera. Now what this does is it moves it over and says, yes, you can do that. And at the end of your duty day, you've flown your five hops, you're approaching the end of the FDP, but you have a little time left. If there's time and if, you know, there's no real gotcha at the brake set, they can reassign. They can give you the extra flying on this particular part about when your FDP starts, okay, or stops, excuse me. What they muddied the water in, in my opinion, when you read through the entire piece is uh, basically it doesn't really tell you wh when, does my, when does my duty stop. And, I, and I, we're going to go back and try to get a little more clarity on this one, but I would suggest that you have a schedule, and I think you could build a, a, a case when you talk with your flight ops managers back home is that you know what the additional flight segments you're going to do on the day. That's your schedule. You walk to the next airplane, you walk to the next airplane, unless they get you and interrupt and say, I need you to do this. Well, the same thing applies. If you're finishing up the last leg of your, of your duty day and you're walking to the curb to go to the hotel, stay on schedule until, and it's the same thing, really kind of a status quo. I think that's what they've built. The language that they wrote here, it doesn't, I think they've left it open for a conversation either industrially or from a policy standpoint between the operator, between the pilots and the uh, certificate holder. Maybe we'll get this down by the sixth or seventh interpretation on the whole deal. Um, and hopefully the next one we can get a little more closure on the whole piece. But for now, the takeaway on this particular one is you finish a flying segment, you've set the brakes and by the definition of FDP finished it, the reality of it is, is they can, they can reschedule you after that event up to the maximum scheduled FDP. Clear as mud. So one key piece at the bottom, buried in a little bit on this, and this is the reason I brought the fitness for duty definition back up at the front end of this thing, is there was a note in there that, says, uh, that references fitness for duty, and that is we have, I think we have some thought in the world that what do I come and sign in fit for duty for? Do I come in and sign fit for duty to do what's on my schedule? Two legs, maybe a pretty easy day. I can eke through that one. And the answer to that is no. You gotta be aware of your daily FDP limits for what the maximum amount of table B or C is. And when you sign in, you're gonna be, unless you call fatigue somewhere, you're gonna be on the hook for that 11, 12, 13, 14 hours, whatever comes out of the table. It's not what you have off of your schedule. You're scheduled for a six hour uh, flight duty period and the maximum allowed by the FAA is 14. Pilots really need to be, you're gonna, Pilots need to be ready and fit for duty for 14.
The last one is really pretty easy. When you have split duty rest, split duty can be assigned, obviously, to a regular pilot through the regular scheduling process. <coughs> On a regular long um, call, reserve pilot can be assigned split duty. The question that was brought up is, can an airport standby reserve, um, obviously that comes, that counts as an FDP. Can that pilot on, that's on an FDP on the standby reserve be assigned to split duty? And the FAA has held that yes, although the time spent at the airport is treated and counted as part of the FDP, the remaining of provisions of the FAR do not become pertinent until a flight assignment is made. Therefore, there is knowledge that there will be a split duty and there is knowledge about the rest. The thing I think that helps drive home a few things here is the second bullet there, and that is in the context of reserve. The flight crew member knows prior to the first segment when the split uh, duty rest is to be taken and the intent behind 11715C, which is important. And this is consistent with how they handle it with a short call wrap and then go to a split duty.